Hey folks, welcome back to the video lectures for Philosophy 120, Critical Thinking, where we continue our unit on categorical logic, the first of several different logical systems we're going to be digging into. So, just as a blueprint for today's lecture, first we're going to recap some of the pile of vocabulary I threw at you last time, and then next we're going to start looking at actually building arguments using those different statements and relationships between categories, between groups of things, and how they fit together. That means that we'll spend some time on the rules of valid syllogisms, the term for the basic argument used for this sort of thing, and then look at a few tips on how to actually apply this kind of reasoning and use it in everyday sorts of life and the kinds of things we look at, and some of the difficulties of working with a rather formal structure in a non-formal world. So, start off with, last time we laid out the basics of categorical logic. That is, we looked at some of the vocab, we looked at the basic units we use in doing this kind of reasoning, and we looked at how some of those different parts fit together. So just as a reminder, depending on when you're watching the videos, how much time's gone between them, and so on, so, categorical logic is logic having to do with the relationships between groups or categories of things. It's the kind of logic that looks for the relationships between terms like some, all, none, and uses the terms are and not to help organize those different relationships. So, this is the kind of logic that deals with statements like all squares are rectangles, uh, some immigrants are good people, um, all Ferraris are expensive cars. These are the kinds of statements that relate things in different categories to each other and allow us to know things and validly infer things about all of this. Because the whole point of this is to learn one of the many different ways that we can have good grounding for the conclusions that we're looking for. Now, Categorical logic uses four basic kinds of statements, the A, E, I, and O statements that we discussed last time. These are the universal affirmative, all X or Y, the universal negative, no X or Y, I, the particular affirmative, some X or Y, and the particular negative, no X or Y. And no, that's not quite right. The particular negative should read some x are not y. So if you would, mark that on your computer screens, correct it in your notes, etc. Uh, but four, four basic statements, A, E, I, and O, which is how we'll refer to them for most of this lecture and throughout the textbook. Now, in addition to getting this sort of vocabulary down, we looked at some of the basic relationships between these different terms, things like conversion, obversion, contrapositive, and so on. These are what we call the rules of immediate inference for categorical statements. And if you need to review over those, we're not, not going to spend a ton of time on them, but we will, at this moment, I mean, but we will refer to them a couple of times throughout this lecture, so feel free to go back to your notes, go back to the previous lecture if you need more of a refresher on those. So, moving ahead, actually making arguments with these things that is using the four basic statements to start forming actual arguments to talk about the world. So the basic argument used with categorical logic is what's referred to as a syllogism. Now syllogism is not just any old argument that uses this. Syllogisms are rather particular kinds of forms. It's like a sonnet when we're working with poetry. It's something that has a certain kind of structure, it has a certain length, and there are certain rules that it has to follow. So a syllogism is a three-line deductive argument that has two premises and a conclusion. Now this argument also has to have all of the statements in categorical form, and that has to involve at least three different categories of thing. So for example, all men are mortal, all mortal things are things that will die, therefore all men are things that will die. This is an example of a categorical syllogism. Now, sometimes the ter term syllogisms used in other situations that don't precisely follow the uh, 
categorical structure, like the classic syllogism I've referred to a few different times in here already. Uh, the all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That's technically a syllogism. It's a three-line argument that has a certain structure to it, but it's not a categorical one. And we're specifically dealing with categorical logic right now. So, keeping these three rules in mind, we can look at the, th the example here. All men are mortal. All mortal things are things that will die. Therefore, all men are things that will die. First off, obviously a three-line argument. We've standardized it. That is, we've numbered the lines. We've laid it out. We've translated it into a certain sort of formal structure. And we've made it relatively clear and easy to read. Uh, all the statements are in categorical form. In particular, we're dealing with nothing but A statements in all of these. So categorical form, it has to be one of those four basic statements. And we're dealing with three different categories. We're dealing with men, mortal, and things that will die. Or I guess if we're being technical, it should be mortal things as opposed to just mortal. Um, so with this, we can say that it's definitely a categorical syllogism. And there's a few different things we can say about it. There are different ways that we can label and break down its structure, and there are different rules for constructing valid syllogisms, ones that will reliably take us from true premises to true conclusions. Now, because we're worried about validity, but as we're trying to figure out valid deductive relationships, we're trying to figure out some of the conditions for good cogent arguments. And for deductive arguments, that means, at least in part, looking for validity. If we remember, that involves looking at structure, which means that we can actually strip away a lot of the details of this. We can reduce this down to just a skeleton of an argument. We can swap out the particular categories involved, like men, mortal things, things that will die, all the wordy bits that end up getting repeated. We can just swap it out for letters so we can more easily see the structure involved with the argument. So if we do that, if we swap out each of the different terms or categories with just a letter to represent it, we get something like all H are M, all M are D, therefore all H are D. Now this kind of more formalized structure is a useful thing for us to work on because in addition to being able to label the premises and the conclusion, this kind of you know, very formal structure allows us to, one, more accurately label and talk about the different parts of the argument, but it also makes that structure much more apparent, much more clear, and we can test for validity much more easily. So let's look at a little bit of vocab and then see how we can use that vocab to discuss and form some different rules for actually making valid syllogisms. So first off, uh, we can label each of the different terms, each of the different uh, categories involved here according to some very traditional terms used from the past. These are the major term, the minor term, and the middle term. So if we first look at the conclusion, because the conclusion is one we care about, it's the thing that we're really trying to establish. The major term is the predicate part of the conclusion. That is, it's the second term in the conclusion. This is what we call the major term. It's the one that really is the definitive thing that we're learning or talking about with the conclusion. It's the second part of the, con of the conclusion of a categorical syllogism. Now, the other part of the conclusion, the other term involved, is what we can call the minor term. And the minor term is the other part of the conclusion, but it's not the one that we have some definitive or new knowledge about. It's the subject that we're talking about. It's the thing, in this case, men or whatever, represented for, with H for human. But it's still less informative. It's the less important of the two. Now, it's not just the importance that determines these two. That's sort of what they imply about it all. But the major term is literally just the second term in the conclusion. The minor term is the first term in the conclusion. And the term that appears in both premises here in the argument 
is what we can call the middle term. The middle term sort of helps bridge the gap between the different premises, but it does not appear in the conclusion on its own. So with these terms, let's talk a little bit about how this sort of thing fits together and how we can actually use Venn diagrams to illustrate why the syllogism works. Because if we go back and read the original thing, all men are mortal, all mortal things are things that will die, therefore all men are things that are, that are things that will die. It just reads as being obviously true. But that's only because it's the kind of example that we're using in an intro critical thinking sort of course. It's not meant to be a complicated example to illustrate things to, you know, to difficultly. That doesn't sound right. But uh, if we want to look at actually why the thing works, rather than just looking at it and say, well, of course, all of that's true. Venn diagrams actually help us map out and visually discuss some of what we're working at with here. <clears throat> I'll switch over to my nice laser pointer effect to make some of this a little more clear. So a lot of different sources, including our textbook, use Venn diagrams all over the place to illustrate these different syllogisms. And honestly, they illustrate things rather well. Uh, the trick is learning how to read them somewhat. <clears throat> Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get the drawing tools to work on my PowerPoint software for all of this, in part because I'm using Google Slides instead of PowerPoint. But uh, looking at the syllogism we're trying to examine, trying to look at the structure of this thing and see why it works, and double check, is it actually a valid syllogism? It looks like one, because it reads like it's full of obvious facts that everybody knows. But... If we do the Venn diagram thing, we could actually illustrate a bit how all the structure fits together. So, first off, I'll check, yeah. Uh, so, first off, traditionally, the Venn diagrams are mapped out with actually a certain sort of design to them. They go from major term to minor term to middle term. So, here we have the major term here on the left, minor term here on the right, and then the middle term gets put down here on the bottom. And we just go ahead and overlap everything like we normally do for Venn diagrams. The interesting part is how we fill in the different parts of this. And we just fill it in according to what each of these things says. Now again, my drawing software, or drawing part of the program isn't working perfectly right or at the very least I can't find the tool in the Google version of this that works the way that I want it to. So our drawing is going to be a little more impermanent, but hopefully you should be able to see and visualize what we're talking about. So if we go down these different premises, we're working with categorical logic. That is, we're working with logic that tells us about the relationships between different categories of things. So each of these lines should tell us something about how the H, D, and M categories of this syllogism fit together. How do things in this category fit or relate with other categories? So when we say something like all H are M, all things that are H are also things that are M, we're essentially saying that there's some kind of overlap between these two categories, that there is something that fits in the space that's in both of them. Now, in particular, we're talking about all H. So everything that fits in this circle, the only things that fit in this circle, are things that also fit into the M circle. All H things are also M things. So if I were permanently coloring in this stuff, I would totally ignore the rest of this circle. The only things that we get filled in on the H circle are the parts that overlap with the M circle because every H thing is an M thing. Now, similarly, the second premise tells us that all M things are also D things. Now, we ought to fit these two together. 
because both of these are being shown to be true. So if all H things are M things, and the only two H parts I'm looking at here is this section, the one that overlaps with M. But the only things in the M circle are the ones that overlap with D circle. Well, then the only part I can actually fill in is this right here. Because all of the H stuff has to go somewhere in the M circle. So it's got to go in one of these two sections. But we also know that all of the M fits in the D stuff. Now the only point where both of those are true is right here in the middle. So the only section I would actually fill in, that I'd actually color in, if I could do so permanently, would be right here in the middle of the thing. Which tells me something. If I look at the Venn diagram and which parts I've filled in, we can see already that the conclusion is sitting there waiting for us. All H are D. The only part of the H circle that I've filled in is part of the D circle. This is the only place where H stuff goes. So in a sense, because this is a valid argument, I can see that the conclusion is already laid out there for me on the Venn diagram. Effectively, after mapping out the first two premises, I can go and check and see whether or not I need any additional information to make this true. If I do, this is not valid. Remember, a valid argument is one that if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. It's impossible for these two to be true and this false. And if that's the case over here with the Venn diagram, then I can effectively use this to check whether or not my conclusion is actually true, whether or not the argument's valid. And additionally, it sort of illustrates how the different categories fit together in a syllogism like this. You know, I'm saying... All the things in this circle are also in that circle. All the stuff in this circle is in this one. And if both of those are true, only one part of this whole thing gets filled in. And it also sort of illustrates the basic fact about these arguments. That if it's a valid argument, then the conclusion is kind of contained in the premises already. That is, you don't need anything else to show that that conclusion is true. It's already there. It's already on the diagram. These two things, the diagram and the conclusion, they tell me the same thing. They tell me the same fact. And if those two match up, then, well, I've got myself a valid argument. Now, on its own, this is mostly useful as a teaching sort of tool. It helps illustrate how the different categories fit together when we're dealing with categorical logic. And it helps us check whether or not we're dealing with a valid argument. But on its own, Venn diagrams are kind of clunky and time-consuming, and God knows we don't want to draw one for every argument we ever deal with. For one, we can't do so in life. You, know, you can't just be watching the news and doodling circle after circle and trying to map everything onto them and expect to actually keep up with anything. So instead, we have to be content with a certain amount of just working with the word parts of this stuff. And we need to know a few basic rules of how valid syllogisms are put together. <laughs> so we need to learn the five basic rules of what makes a valid categorical syllogism. Now, it's worth noting, if you're looking at any syllogism whatsoever, anything in that structure, if it fails any of these rules, that is, if it doesn't satisfy it, if it doesn't follow it, it's an invalid argument. So all it takes is failing one of these to be invalid. In order to be valid, it has to meet all of them. And we can just run down the list of these. Now, this is different from the list of rules that we looked at 
for what makes a syllogism. These are the rules that something has to be to be a syllogism at all. These are what we need for valid ones. And if we just go down the line, some of them are going to seem a little obvious. And if they don't, thinking a little bit more deeply about how the things fit together shows that it's honestly fairly straightforward. These are not arcane or strange rules. Excuse me. That'll be difficult to memorize or learn or anything like that. First off, uh, the middle term of a syllogism must be distributed in at least one premise. And we'll look at examples of each of these in a moment. Let's just get the rules down at first. So the middle term has to be distributed in at least one premise. Additionally, no term can be distributed in the conclusion unless the term is distributed in at least one premise. One premise also has to be affirmative, at least one of the two. If you are working with negative premises, if the conclusion's negative, there has to be at least one negative premise. We can't go from all positive affirmative premises and pull a negative conclusion out of the thin air. Similarly, uh, if a syllogism has two universal premises, it cannot have a particular conclusion and still be valid. That is, so long as we're working with the modern hypothetical interpretation of what each of these statements means. Now, if all of that went in one ear and out the other, let's look at this in a little more detail. And some of the reasons for these rules will start to make a little bit more sense. So remember, when we're talking about distributed terms, we're talking about terms that say something about every member of the, relative cate of the relevant category. So if you remember, we're looking at A statements for each of the things in this example, using the same one as before. Now, A statements distribute the first term involved with them. When we say all H are M, we're only talking about every member of category H. We're not necessarily talking about all the M's out there in the world. But premise two does. Premise two talks about all the M's in the world, but doesn't necessarily talk about all the D's and etc. So a distributed term is one that talks about every member of that category. And for A statements, the first term is distributed. Now, if we also add on the labels of D, uh, major term, minor, and middle, we can start to look at how these rules fit together. The middle term has to be distributed for this to be valid. So if we're looking at a syllogism like this, that middle term is what does the linking between the two different premises. Uh, if we look at a couple of other examples, this might show up a, a little bit better. One that doesn't just repeat all of the universal statements. So in order for a valid syllogism to work, the middle term, that is the one that's in the premises, but not the conclusion, has to sort of link those two premises together. And it also has to be distributed in at least one premise. And this is important because if, we, if we're not talking about all of the members of that middle category, we might be leaving something off. Like if we look at our example here, sum x or y, all y or z, therefore sum x or z. Though I'll go ahead and spoil it, this is a valid syllogism. Sum x or y, all y or z, therefore sum x or z. It's impossible for these two premises to be true and this conclusion to be false. But why? Why is this a valid one? Why does this syllogism work? Well, because it, for one, it meets all of our requirements. But it's not just a because Aristotle said so kind of deal. It's not how philosophy works. If we look at the whole syllogism, the major term is Z. It's the last one in the conclusion. The minor term 
is x. It's the first in the conclusion. And the middle term is y, because it shows up in both premises, but no conclusion. So first off, we say some x are y. Let's say some kittens are cute. That seems to be a true premise, and we can just work with that for now. Now, if we then say all cute things are lovable things, well, let's go ahead and say that that's also a true statement. Cute, thing, cute is lovable. Sounds like a working relationship to me. And then we conclude, therefore, some kittens are lovable, which also looks to be true. Why? When I say some kittens are cute, I'm saying that there are at least some kittens, there's at least one kitten in the world that is also a cute sort of thing. But if you notice, I'm not saying anything about all of them. And accordingly, I'm not on its own saying that uh, all cute things link up with kittens. So if I start trying to draw conclusions just from this statement and say that some kittens are cute, it's really difficult for me to go from here to here, saying that some kittens are lovable. Because unless I establish a link between cute and lovable, I can't go from X to Z. I have to go through that middle step. So for one, there has to be a middle term. That middle term has to show up in both premises to link X and Z together. Or in the previous example, M has to link H and D together, because otherwise I can't jump from humans to things that will die. Now, in addition to there having to be a middle term, that middle term has to be distributed. It has to talk about every member of that group. Because if I didn't, if I didn't cover every member of group Y, well, then it might be possible for these to both be true and the conclusion to still be false. There are gaps in what I'm justified saying things about. There are gaps in my reasoning. So if we go back to the kitten version of this example, if I were to say some kittens are cute, and then pretend that this didn't say all. Suppose that it just said some again. If I said some kittens are cute, some cute things are lovable things, that doesn't give me enough ground to actually justify saying some kittens are lovable. Because if we were to draw out the Venn diagrams for all of this, it would be possible for some kittens to be cute and for those same kittens to also be lovable, but they don't have to. It's possible that all of the cute things and all of the lovable things are totally separate. You know, if we use maybe a different example, we could see the same sort of point. Let's say some shoes are expensive things, because some shoes are expensive. If I said some expensive things are worth buying, that can also be true. But that doesn't automatically mean that all shoes that are expensive are also worth buying. If I use nothing but some, if I use nothing but the limited, the particular versions of these statements, I can't justify my conclusion. So the middle term Y has to be distributed at some point in the premises. At some point, we have to cover all of our bases and talk about every member of a category. So in at least one of these two premises, doesn't have to be both of them, but at least one of them, we have to distribute that middle term. We have to talk about every member of the middle terms group, every member of that category. Now, if we do that, then we can make the leap from X to Z by going through Y along the way. Now, similarly, we have to do some. We have to do the same sort of thing with negative statements. Uh, on its own, um, 
well, I guess on its own is the wrong segue to use there. So if we look at a negative syllogism here, we say no A or B, some B or C, therefore no A or C. So if we go down through our rules, the five rules for valid syllogisms, we can test quickly and see whether or not this is valid. So first off, is there a middle term? Does it show up in both premises? Yes, I've got a middle term that goes between one and two. Now, is that middle term distributed? Well, yes, because negative statements actually distribute over both of their terms. It's saying that neither of these two groups fit together. If we look at our others, we have a negative conclusion. So there has to be at least one negative premise. And we have a combination of universal in particular. So we can have a universal uh, conclusion as well. So it looks like this would also be a valid syllogism. It meets each of our requirements. Middle terms distributed, yep. Can't be distributed in the conclusion. Yep. Oh wait, no, no we can't. Here's where we get caught up. So if we look back at our rules and double check against this, no term can be distributed in the conclusion unless that term is distributed in at least one premise. So, so far, everything looked okay. You know, we have a middle term. That middle term is distributed in at least one point because the universal one distributes. We have our negatives working out just fine. And we have no worries about jumping from all particular statements to universal statements, but we get caught up with one other point. The fact that we have a distributed term here that's not distributed here. So here we don't have a justification for talking about all C's. E statements like this, the universal negative, distribute both of their terms. If we say that no animals are cute, we're saying that there are no animal things that are also cute things. If we say that no smokers are healthy, we're saying that no smokers fit in this category of being healthy, and no healthy people fit into the category of being smokers. Both of those are said by the same statement. Now, because we're talking about all of C, we have to talk about all of C somewhere up here. Otherwise, we're not justified in moving from some small part of C to talking about all of C. We're just, we don't have any evidence for it. So while this looks like a valid syllogism by most of the rules, one of those little bits of relationship actually matters quite a lot. We do have to worry about which terms are distributed and which ones aren't. Uh, for one, we can call the mistake of not distributing that middle term the fallacy of the undistributed middle, because, of course, there's a fallacy for it. There's a fallacy for everything. But also not distributing means we might not justify some of the claims that we make. So we need to watch which terms are distributed in which kinds of statements. That does matter quite a lot for valid arguments. Uh we could go through a few other examples of the same format, but honestly, the homework in the textbook will run you through enough of those that I don't need to talk your ear off about it right here. If you do have questions on this or if you want to run through more with me, I'd be happy to, but I won't drag up the video to do three or more versions of the same sort of structure when the homework is going to do the exact same sort of thing. But... What do we do with all this? How do we actually use this kind of info? Because for one, I guarantee you're almost never going to see something out in the world that's structured like this. 
you're almost never going to see an argument that actually has terms either labeled out with variables like this or that's all nice and neat with things in a nice standardized format. It's just virtually never going to happen. So how do we actually use this? Well, for one, you will have to translate some. You're going to have to do the same kind of standardization and conversion from ordinary language to standardized, you know, more formal language, if we want to use that sort of term for it. But the reason why you might want to do so is because even though you don't see this sort of, you know, correctly formed syllogism out in the world, the concepts and the reasoning still show up a lot. People use syllogisms, just not fully formed syllogisms. Because remember that we do talk about things in categories quite a lot, even if we don't always use the terms all and some. Take something that comes out of a lot of like fluff pieces on blogs or uh, that uh, journalism sites will put out, saying something like, well, millennials don't appreciate hard work, or millennials are killing Applebee's, or this whatever the new industry of the month is. Uh, when these sorts of papers or pundits or people talk about things like millennials don't appreciate hard work, well, honestly, that's a categorical statement. That's saying something like, no millennials are people who appreciate hard work. Or it might mean something like, all millennials are people who don't appreciate hard work. We could translate it either way, and it honestly doesn't make much of a difference. But regardless, we see something like millennials don't appreciate hard work or immigrants are all stealing your jobs or something like that. These statements are categorical statements. They're talking about things in categories. They're talking about the members of a particular group. Or if we want to even get away from people, it's talking about things that fit under a certain description. If we were to talk about something like... Um, Black holes are massive dead stars or something like that, or are the remnants of dying massive stars. But that's a categorical statement. It's saying that all black holes are some other thing. It's saying all the things in one concept fit into another one. So we use this kind of categorical reasoning quite a bit. And when we translate broad statements like this, we can do so. We can usually take this kind of large statement or statements about particular subsets of these groups and turn them into categorical statements and see how they relate to each other. And often these kinds of arguments are made in the world for various points. Uh, if it helps when you're doing this kind of translation, it's I think it's helpful to end up asking yourself, is this sentence about a group or about a certain kind of thing unified by one trait? Can, can I put the subject of this sentence into a group defined by some trait? You know, millennials are obviously a group that share a trait. If we're talking about not appreciating hard work, we could translate that into people who don't appreciate hard work. So translating and turning these things into formalized sentences can be done if we ask about, can I fit this into a category? Now, some statements and some arguments don't fit into this structure. If you remember when we first talked about categorical logic, we talked about how this system doesn't cover everything. But for the things that it does cover, we can often take the loose sort of statements that people make and build them into formal syllogisms. Uh, usually they're not structured well in standardized formats. But they are presented in something that the Greeks called an enthymeme, that is an incomplete syllogism, a syllogism that's lacking either a premise or a conclusion. Like Take, for example, the following enthymeme. All squares are rectangles, therefore all squares are figures with four corners. This is, oddly enough, a valid syllogism. It's a deductively valid inference being made. But there's a missing premise right in between these two. 
saying that all rectangles are figures with four corners. From that, or once we add that, we can rewrite this into a full-on regularly structured syllogism, and we can evaluate it and see that it's valid. We can see that this is something that's true. So, using this stuff, it does show up out in the world, even if it's not formal, even if it's not obvious, there are actually terms for that, and there are procedures for putting them back together. Just like at the first couple of units, we looked at translating arguments and adding in missing premises. We can do the exact same thing here with categorical arguments and categorical syllogisms. We can also string multiple syllogisms together, what the Greeks called sorites. Now, sorites is nothing more than a long stream of connected enthymemes. That is, it's a long, connect, long string of syllogisms that usually just have to have the intermediate conclusions stuck in between to glue each of the things together. Now, I bring this up not just to give you a couple of nice Greek words to pull out at a party at some point, but to say that a lot of times out in the world, we will see arguments that have a syllogistic kind of structure to them. But in order to test whether or not they're valid, we have to fill in those missing statements and then test each of the component syllogisms. And again, the textbook and the homework will run you through a few different examples of this. But overall, it usually just means finding the intermediate conclusions and then applying those different rules that we have looking to see whether or not the middle term is distributed. Are we actually distributing everything that we need to? Are we jumping from positive statements to negative statements, or are we actually following the rules of including some negative claims along the way, and so on? So knowing to look for these sorts of things, having a name for it, and knowing that there is something to do about it can help us start recognizing them out in the actual world and thus start actually evaluating the arguments and points that are made by people, which is part of the point of this whole class. This isn't meant to be just a dry philosophical logic sort of thing. It's meant to be a toolkit to help you do whatever it is you do. So, things to be aware of. Things to practice recognizing and evaluating, if at all possible. But, as far as basics of categorical logic go, that about covers it. Uh, as I said, the homework in the textbook will give you a lot more material to practice with, and while I'd be happy to run through examples with you and answer any questions and everything, I won't do so here on the YouTube video. Uh, I do highly encourage you, though, in addition to the exercises in the book, I really recommend that you guys actually start looking for these sorts of things out in real life. Take a look at the social media posts that you see. If somebody posts an Instagram story about you know something in the news, or if you're still on Facebook and you know somebody's uncle posts that crazy thing that everybody's got an uncle that posts crazy things about, well, take a look at it. Take a look and see why is the reasoning not so great, or is it? Is it actually worth reconsidering your views about something, not just in politics or religion or any other hot button topic? But recognize the reasoning and the argument about everything. You know, somebody is always trying to convince you of something. And I guarantee a lot of them are basically using syllogisms to do so. You know, our textbook has a syllogism about Burger King, of all things, as one of its examples. So, I mean, it's not like this stuff doesn't apply or work in real life. It's worth trying to recognize it and start trying to shift our perspective about it a little bit and seeing that with the right tools, with the right terms, and the right way of thinking, we can actually engage with this stuff actively and choose whether or not to agree with it, and to do so with good reason. Now in the future, we'll keep looking at different systems of argument. We'll look at different logical systems and different ways of constructing cogent or good arguments. But for now, Focus on drilling and practicing with the categorical stuff. Make sure to take a look at the unit checklist and the assignments. Make sure you don't leave anything off. And until then, good luck and happy thinking, guys.